Hello and welcome. Welcome to Learning Thursdays. I am Patty Corbett Ward. I am a trainer in the Learning and Development Unit at Oasis in Albany. I will be your host for this presentation, which is entitled Truth, a holistic approach to treating veterans and their families. And this will be presented by Zachary Randolph. Paul Noonan, who is the OASIS Veterans Liaison, will join us in a moment to introduce Zachary to you. In the interim, I would like to provide a cursory overview of the Learning Thursdays educational series. A goal, as you see on the slide, of Learning Thursdays is to support and help advance the educational and professional competency development of the treatment, prevention, and recovery workforce. A competency being comprised of knowledge, skills, and attitudes relative to a specific task. In part, we do this by offering monthly presentations that highlight contact and topic areas that are both current and relevant to our field. In a moment, you will meet Zachary and Paul. In the interim, if you ever have questions, please feel free to send them to the mailbox, learningthurs at oasis.my.gov. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Paul Noonan from Oasis will take over and introduce you to Zachary. I will talk with you at the end of the presentation. That being said, thank you, Paul, and welcome. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Noonan the coordinator of veteran services for Oasis and welcome to another learning Thursdays um, each November November being the month during which veterans veterans days falls we try to bring you a presentation on the issue of veterans and treatment of substance use disorders I'm pleased to say we have an expert speaker with us today who's going to present a, a terrific program on a uh, treatment model that's now currently in use at St. Joseph's Rehabilitation Center in Saranac Lake. A little background on this. In 2008, Oasis released a, uh, what we call a planning supplement, but for you laymen out there, it was basically an RFP, where we were seeking um, proposals that would uh, establish a total of 100 treatment beds in upstate New York reserved for veterans. St. Joseph's Rehab was one of the respondents and subsequently received an award and they built a beautiful, and I've been there to see this personally, beautiful facility, 25 bed intensive residential program for veterans right in the middle of the beautiful Adirondacks. The um, program was built, it's a, brand, it's a brand new building and it was opened for, uh, it's, it started admitting patients in July of 2014, had their formal ribbon cutting in September of 2014. It's a 20, once again, it's a 25 bed facility which uh, admits only veterans. We're very pleased to have it within the OASIS service system. And I know they do good work. And with us today is the director of that facility, Mr. Zach Randolph, who's going to present to you on a treatment model an approach called TRUCE, T-R-U-C-E. I'll let him explain what that means in greater detail, but it is a holistic approach to treating veterans and their families, and it seems to be working quite well. Zach, of course, is a, is a KSAC, a Credentialed Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Counselor, with a, a lot of experience in, in our field. More importantly, he is a U.S. Army veteran, and that experience may count more than any other. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Zach, who will tell you all about truce. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And welcome to Learning Thursdays. My name is Zachary Randolph. I'm going to be the instructor for this, um, this block of education. I appreciate the time and the consideration of taking um, time out of your schedule to uh, learn a little bit more about veterans, their families, and how we can best interact with them. This morning, I'd like to start with just a brief introduction of um, my formal education, which is actually through the um, through seminary. Uh, I came through the field in a little different direction than typical, 
And what's important to highlight about that this morning is that during my time in seminary, one of the strongest points of education that I received was through uh, the practice or study of hermeneutics. And if I can define hermeneutics, it's the method or theory of interpretation, especially for literary or biblical texts. So the reason that's important today is because before we get into how we're going to treat um, our veteran-specific population and their families, I'd like to spend some time and understand um, the goals and the culture of, of the field that we're working in currently. <clears throat> As you may know, the, the context of a conversation is quite important. And the study of hermeneutics is really what that's all about. It's understanding your context, how a passage, a smaller passage, fits in a larger passage, and helps us understand purpose and identify the main points of a passage. And that's what we're going to strive to do this morning. My goals for this training are to, one, identify the current climate of the field that we're working in, two, understand our identity and purpose in that climate, three, take the time to understand what it means and how our practices are best suited in the environment that we're moving to. Finally, I'd like to be able to use a case study, which is the veterans program itself at St. Joseph's, as a way to show examples and kind of walk out the concepts that I'm going to be expressing earlier in this training. If I were to ask you to describe the current climate of our field, the substance use disorder field, in one word, take a second and think about what you would say. Quite often when I ask this question, words like scary or changing or stressful are identified. And what I'd like to do is just capitalize in the sense that right now we're in an we're in a environment of change. And change can be scary and it can be stressful, particularly when we have a pre-existing identity crisis. And that's, again, one of the goals we're going to address in this block of education. The identity crisis is under, not understanding who we are in the puzzle of our agency and in the context of this field. So it's extremely important to understand who we are as service providers, clinical supervisors, and auxiliary and support staff for this particular field. As we move into the, the new climate and the new um, field of substance use disorder, we're going to have to engage in strategic partnering. It's just a way of life. And the important part is that's, an, that's a positive experience. Being able to partner with other service providers or other elements within the communities that we provide services in, it's a, it's a blessing. And the reason being is because it allows for creative resources, collective empowerment, and the ability to get fresh eyes and new perspective on what we're currently offering. As managed care begins to work its way out and we are introduced to outcome-based service provision, and a reduction in regulatory guidelines, we start asking questions if we don't understand who we are as an agency or organization or as a service provider within one. <clears throat> the reality is, is that as we, as we mature and as we grow into this new world, we're going to have to understand that service providers are going to be re reimbursed, referred to, and partnered with based on our ability to not only provide effective treatment, but to do so in a way that's clear, consistent, articulated, and easily captured using different forms of assessment tools, individualized treatment benchmarks, and quality of life indicators, which are acknowledged by the managed care companies. That might be an overwhelming statement in and of itself, but the reality is, is I'm sure you're already doing the phenomenal work that needs to be done. It's more a question of capturing it. You see, if you have the first, which is the phenomenal, great, rich program that offers services, could be considered a this is the way we've always done it, but you don't have the second, which is the proof of the outcomes and the positive uh, change that you impact on people's life, then you might be offering amazingly unique and effective services, but you won't be reimbursed or identified accordingly. Or the other option is if you're a newer program or a program that has identified assessment tools and are using the tools, but you don't necessarily have a unique understanding of who you are and how you practice, then you might only be providing managed care providers the realization that you aren't worth supporting. It's a dangerous place to be only if you don't understand who you are. So let's look at that a little bit further. The truth is, is we're at a fork in the road in our, in our field. And with every crisis, there's opportunity. This is really a choose-your-own-adventure 
question. And the question is, are we going to see this as stressful or are we going to decide that this is exciting and we're going to engage wholeheartedly in understanding who we are as an organization, as an individual service provider in the field. And what we need to do is understand our roots and our heritage to best define who we are and how we practice. This is a poem. As I speak, please take your time and read it. Specific to veterans and military service members, William Ernest Henley did a phenomenal job of helping us understand the heart and the valor that goes with serving our country. Understanding this poem and the individuals that it capitalizes on helps us understand that there is a warrior ethos that will never leave a veteran or a service member. Understanding the context and identity of those we serve is just as important as understanding our own identity and context. And throughout this next block of education, we're going to work on the second goal, which is understanding our identity. I'd like to talk to you about prolegomena. This word, as defined as a noun, is a critical or discursive introduction, introduction to a book. Again, you'll read that the origin is mid-17th century. It's Latin from the Greek, passive present, to say beforehand. Those are our roots. This is where we come from. And it is extremely important as service providers or people working in the human services agency to understand our roots. It helps us with our identity crisis. Understanding who we are as an organization and as a culture and as a substance use provision field is of utmost importance. Who we are is the culture. It's the culture of our staff. It's the culture of the population we serve. It's the culture of the communities that we provide services in. It includes demographics, education levels, and personalities. And of course, it's important to remember that we're all human, that a certain amount of grace should come expected with being human. Understanding our culture as teams and as groups is imperative to understand our identity. If we're out of touch with the culture of our teams, then we're, we're an island. We're isolated, we don't feel connected, and we begin to lose purpose. So it's important to understand before we begin serving and practicing our, our education and our skills that we understand who we are in the world that we work in and those that we work with. The next step is understanding what we do. These are largely our agency goals, the regulatory policies and procedures that help humans and keep us open and productive. Understanding what we do is a very practical concept, but how many of us are able to identify what our specific level of care is, what the regulations say for that level of care, what are the policies and procedures that you're engaging in fulfilling every day or not? What's the canon of ethics that you've identified? What's your code of conduct? These are the practical pieces to our day-to-day -day practice that we need to understand in order to be able to do what we do well. The next step is understanding how we do it. Largely, I would suggest this is our methodologies or protocols or processes, and it's the state of the physical environment. It's the world around us. It's the, it's the attitude that we bring to work. How we do is what makes us unique as service providers. It's why one resident might relate with you over another clinician. It's why a resident might choose your agency to receive treatment services from as opposed to another agency. It's how we best manage and fit people into the best individual care that we can possibly give them. And what we need to understand is if we are all the same and we look like cookie cutter service providers, there will be very little choice in the matter for individuals that need specific, unique care. We need to understand that how we do what we do is integral to understanding who we are. Finally, we need to understand why we do what we do. I would suggest that this is largely based in the roots of our agency's mission and vision. While I ask you this right now, do you know your agency's mission? Do you know this, 
statement of their vision? What's their goals? What's their strategic plan for the future? These are important to understand because if you come into work and you don't know these things, then why is it you come into work at all? And why do you go to that specific agency to work? So again, in understanding beforehand, our practice needs to be built off and our understanding needs to be built off of everything that our agency stands for, starting with our mission and vision. Taking all of these who, what, how, and why and putting them together allows us to understand the puzzle and the context in which our smaller contribution affects the larger. And understanding that if we lose sight of these four specific elements that should come before we engage in practice, we begin to lose identity and purpose and what results is a loss of effectiveness in our treatment and service provision for the special populations that we serve. Take a look at your day-to-day -day programming and identify what works. Again, going back to the idea that managed care is going to look at outcome-based information and not necessarily the dotted I's and T's crossed of your paperwork. It's easy to say that you offer evidence-based practices. I could list off the numerous acronyms of DD, IDDT, DBT, REBT, CBT, and go on and on. And we know that there's curriculum out there. But again, if we all just did that out of the curriculum in a rote manner, keeping with the fidelity of the curriculum, then we're going to look very much the same. So while best practices are absolutely first and foremost on any program provider to add to their list of, of tools, what's more important is understanding what else works for the specific population, what strengths do your team members bring, and how do you capitalize on them in order to provide the best and most effective treatment for the population you serve. The question of understanding what modalities, what theories, who are your heroes in the field? Understanding the difference between Carl Rogers' worldview and Albert Ellis's, and understanding Maslow's hierarchy of need, implementing Prochaska and De Clemente's stages of change. These are words and people you need to understand and get to know and get very intimate with their worldview and their tools so that you're able to articulate to an auditor or to a resident why it is you do what you do and how you're going to progress through their treatment episode in a way that managed care companies are going to suggest is viable. Asking what subjective client-specific interventions work. So these are ones that, that might be a little bit out of the box. Understanding that as you see the slide that we're, we're using for this particular block of information, we live in a very beautiful area in the Adirondacks. Mountains are abound, there's hiking, canoeing, biking, and many other outdoor activities that veterans absolutely love. And being able to understand and capitalize on that opportunity and those opportunities and those unique um, geographic gifts is really important in understanding the subject of what works. And how do you include those into your treatment plans and into a course of treatment episode in a way that managed care is able to identify that they couldn't live without those experiences to be successful and have sustained recovery. Understanding the culture and climate of the agency in general, taking the clients and setting them aside for a minute, understanding parallel process and the fact that if the agency is struggling at an executive level, it will most likely struggle at a direct service level, which will then look like disturbance and collective disturbance on a residential level, is really important. If you and your team and your colleagues aren't able to work together in a happy, healthy, safe environment, then most likely your residents won't be able to enjoy a happy, healthy, safe environment. So it's integral to make sure that you take your culture and your agency's culture into consideration before even providing any form of treatment. How do you take care of each other and how you take care of yourself is something to be taken into consideration before service is even provided. And now we come to the case study block of education. This will largely be the last goal and where we we'll spend most of our time. I've tried to build a worldview and an understanding and per perspective of why it's so important to understand where we come from, the roots, 
of our agencies, the heritage and tradition that comes with it, and most importantly, why it's so important to veterans that you have this knowledge and are able to articulate this understanding because they will know if you don't. The case study that I'm going to present is focused on the St. Joseph's Veterans Program. Like Paul mentioned earlier, we started in July of 2014. After um, a few years of, of uh, groundbreaking building and identifying a really strong team. Part of identifying our team that took considerable time was understanding that it's important to find team members that have cultural sensitivity to the population you're working with. For example, at St. Joseph's Veterans Program, many of the staff, if not all of the staff, are either veterans themselves or have an immediate family member or spouse that's either serving or has served. This understanding of the culture, this inundation into what the culture is and what life looks like within a, within a military worldview is important so as that we do not try and take the military out of the veteran, but help the veteran reintegrate from the military. If we expend all our energy trying to change a culture that will largely does not desire to be changed, then we're expending energies that can be better served and helping them find sustained recovery and a quality of life using their culture as their strengths. Understanding the adversity history or the trauma history of the agency that you work with is also very important. As a case study, St. Joseph's Veterans Program experienced its first overdose in-house after three months of opening its doors. This was quite traumatic for staff and residents alike. When we interviewed and we spoke with residents and did crisis management to help them process, the interesting piece with the veterans was they actually were trying to counsel us more than themselves. They informed us that this is quite typical, that the veteran population is one of the most complex and challenging populations to work with, and that we should begin to thicken our skin and understand that veterans go big or go home. This was made real with the overdose experience. And helping us as a team, the gift was that we had to sharpen our skills, engage in methodologies, and creating protocols that kept people safe and healthy early in our life. This has allowed us to focus on not only the safety, but also the well-being of our residents as we mature and offer quality services. Another important part of the roots and heritage of the inception of the Veterans Program at St. Joseph's is the introduction of a trauma-informed community of care model called the Sanctuary Model. The implementation of this model has allowed us the framework and understanding of trauma-informed populations, how to reduce the amount of traumatization and re-traumatization during a treatment episode, and allowed some guiding commitments to live by for staff and for residents both. The introduction of the sanctuary model has allowed us to create some open communication within staff and residents alike. We've introduced house meetings that allow residents on a weekly basis to offer feedback as far as what they would prefer in living environment or changes that need to be made or their perspective on how we can provide better, healthier treatment services. This partnering with the individuals receiving treatment has not only been to their benefit, but then to those who have followed them through treatment. For staff to be open to a culture of democracy and open communication is sometimes difficult. We want to make sure we have power and authority. But the real power and authority is in having the grace and mercy to include the people receiving treatment in the process of creating healthier, safer treatment. And the opportunity the Sanctuary Model offers with the seven commitments and guiding tools allows us as staff and residents to have common language to understand each other. Along with a few audits, CARF audits, and certifications, we've learned a lot about our program and our program services. During the audits, my experience largely was trying to find binders full of information protocols, procedures, and statistics, handing them to the OASIS field officers or the auditing group 
and trying to explain to them what we do on a regular basis. This was not good enough for me. I wanted to make sure that we were able to articulate who we are, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it in a succinct manner that's tangible. And I wanted to make sure that we're able to articulate the program so that others can learn from us, that we can share information, and that collectively the field can grow, particularly with serving veterans and their families. This led to us finding a theme and a framework to the program that we provide at St. Joseph's Veterans Program. The theme is experiencing recovery. And the framework is the truce framework, the truce model. And we're going to talk about that now. I identified the sanctuary model as a trauma-informed care model. I'd like to review very quickly the guiding commitments of that model. As you'll see on the screen, there's nonviolence. This is physical, emotional, mental, spiritual nonviolence. A commitment to emotional intelligence in reading other people, understanding each other, having empathy. Social learning, being able to learn from the environment that you live in, the nuances of others and of the culture you're trying to create. Open communication, allowing for dialogue and not one-way conversation or authoritative directions, but actually having interactions that are pleasant and two-way streets to allow for effective treatment. Social responsibility, helping both residents and staff understand that they're not an island in and of themselves, that there should be accountability and structure in someone's life, particularly in a, in a team setting and in an environment where we know as substance use providers, structure and regimen are quite often some of the healthiest early recovery opportunities we can make. Democracy, understanding this is pure democracy and not majority wins, but that everybody has a voice and everybody's voice has value. Understanding that even the dietary team can offer you clinical insight that can save someone's life and being open to that, respecting and valuing each other. And finally, growth and change. Understanding that living in a stagnant world, doing what we've always done, will not get us far in this new changing climate. We need to be open to being creative, to being able to articulate who we are and what we do, and open to changing some of our practices in order to provide better individualized and person-centered services. You may ask, why a truce? As I will in this final block of education walk through the acronym of TRUCE, I'd like to explain why we came up with the word and model frame of TRUCE. As you remember that poem Invictus before, Invictus means unconquered soul. It's helping us understand and keep in mind and being vigilant that a veteran, a service member, first training is to never give up, never quit, and to fight on. Mission first, always, and last. It's important to keep this in mind when working with a veteran population, particularly in the substance use field. This idea of hopelessness, powerlessness, throwing in the flag, of accepting defeat, of giving up, or losing a battle, these do not sit well with service members, nor will it sit well for their family members. In fact, it can be traumatizing to use words like this, particularly if the veteran individual you're speaking with has lost someone during their experience in the service. It's important to keep this in mind because many of the tenants of some of the most important sober support networks we use, such as AA and NA, strongly hold to an acceptance and need for acceptance of hopelessness, or excuse me, of powerlessness and giving up and accepting that we will not defeat this addiction. So the reason the Veterans Program at St. Joseph's has decided to use the framework of truce is because that's very much what we want to help the individual veteran understand, is that while they're spending long-term treatment with us, we're asking them not to give up, but to create a truce, a truce with their addiction, a truce with the different challenges that have come from the consequences of their disease, 
and a truce possibly from some relationships that have become toxic or volatile. Understanding why a truce is so important is really understanding how do you meet a veteran at their level, meet them where they're at, and help them progress out. So as far as a truce goes, what this is is two, typically two adversaries agreeing to hit the pause button or stop for a certain amount of time to regather themselves, to collect their thoughts, to create a new plan, and to re-engage. And we fully understand that with this disease and with recovery, if we're able to make an illustration, it is a battle with this disease. It is a battle and a war that we will fight the rest of our lives if we're in recovery. So allowing us to create a truce with our addiction and have a safe place to be able to stop, rethink our plan, have our thoughts and experiences challenged, reframed, to find safe sanctuary in a place where we're able to communicate our past experiences and identify a new way of thinking or living may be very well what we need so that when we walk out the door, we can begin the battle again and be much more successful. So you ask, what is truce? The acronym stands quite simply for some of the most successful elements that the St. Joseph's Veterans Program has experienced in their two years offering services to veterans. So as I walk through the acronym, we will specifically talk about each one in detail. The first element is time. Quite often it's overlooked that actual chronological clock time can be one of the most important things for somebody in early recovery. Being able to gain clean time allows for positive experiences and for the opportunity to engage in life on different terms. And so the idea of trying to prolong the amount of time someone is in a safe and healthy area, a sanctuary I will use, is important to help them understand that it's possible. It builds hope, it reduces fear, and allows for positive experiences that can reduce anxiety. The other integral element of time is it allows people to tell their story. If there's anything we know about trauma, the main way to work and walk through trauma is to tell one's story. And working with veterans who have been through combat-related experiences, this can take a long time to even get to the story itself. And quite often, that story has turned into such a debilitating experience that it's hard to even put it into words. And so allowing a veteran to have time to talk about anything he wants to talk about allows him to create trust and relationships that will allow him to slowly and hopefully open up to being able to tell their story. Quite often, once a story is told, it's easier to retell and you start adding more and more people to their circle of trust, which allows for the healing elements that go into reducing trauma and traumatized experiences. Another specific piece to the element of time is the ongoing use of your assessment tools. Like we previously identified how important those are to who we are, how we do what we do, and why we do what we do, it's just as important for the service member. Understanding the culture of a service member in the sense of learning and basic training skills, there is the adage of crawl, walk, run. A service member during basic training quite often will learn in a sitting or in, an, or in a classroom setting at a table and learn in block instruction much like we are today. Then they'll be taken out into the field and they will be asked to slowly walk through whatever process they've just learned and then it'll, be, then it'll be assessed in real time. That is the essence of crawl, walk, run. Helping service members through their treatment episode can be as important to crawl, walk, run with their assessments. So for example, using a PTSD scale, maybe the PCL5, will allow the service member to understand that when they came in, they were crawling. And as they progress, you're able to identify and show them in a tangible way that they're now walking and towards the end of their treatment or towards the end of the completion of that treatment goal, they're able to recognize that the maintenance stage is largely they're running. 
and they're in the marathon, which is sustained recovery. This is important because not only are those tools the same tools you'll use for reimbursement and to show your outcomes, those are the same tools that will help them have tangible proof that they're making change, which quite often is one of the most hopeless experiences someone in addiction has, is that the fear that there's no change possible. Understanding that stabilization is also an element of time, the stabilization of symptoms, the opportunity to gain grounding skills, coping skills, resiliency skills, these take time. And not only learning them, but like I said, the theme of experiencing recovery at St. Joe's is not just learning and practicing, but it's the running. How do you allow for an environment to let them engage in experiences that put those school skills to test? If we are not allowing them some form of opportunity to practice their skills, then they're going to struggle with reintegration because they will not have positive experiences of using those skills to draw from. The amount of time and the longer the time they're able to be afforded in a safe, healthy environment allows for life to happen, but the more ability we're able to let life happen on life terms allows them to put those skills into practice. And that's where we involve family members, loved ones, opportunities to interact with the community in different ways, opportunities for them to get out of the facility and bump into life will allow them to put these skills into practice. And oftentimes, although it's hard to state, it gives them time to fail. It gives them time to experience what failure is and how to appropriately work through that. Sometimes that's the most beneficial gift someone can get, is understanding that a failure is actually a success as an educational piece. Time experiences the, um, uh, the allowance for positive experiences. The more positive experiences using skills and worldviews allows for reduced anxiety, reduced symptoms of depression, and allows for more self-regulatory opportunity to understand that they're able to use the values that they learned as a service member in their civilian life. What we're trying to do is give them the time to become warrior citizens. And finally, the element of time allows for the insight, the gaining of insight into themselves, purpose, trust, and their relationships. Working with family members, understanding systems theory, specifically the family system theory, that while the service member was activated or was not with that family, that largely roles get confused People have to step in, and when that individual comes back, that service member might not understand who they are and how they fit in their family. And so giving them time to be able to process this, have slow, short interactions that increase with their loved ones, helps for appropriate and proper role understanding and transition back into a, their purpose in their family, in their connections, and their community. The second element of truce is respite. While I agree that respite can just simply mean rest, as we, we know with brain development and brain understanding, that early recovery quite often requires rest. The brain is trying to get back on track. It's trying to mature. It's trying to get back to the age that it's, it's currently physically in. And that quite often looks like rest. So please keep in mind that while you have, we must have programming and we must have it in abundance, that time, leisure time and rest time is equally important. Quite often what I hear from our service members, I quite often refer them as heroes, is they'll come to me and say, listen, I've been through a lot of treatment. And you know what? You need to do more. I don't know what to do with my downtime. I start having thoughts about doing unhealthy things with my downtime. The beauty of that is that that allows us to have a conversation about respite and what to do with leisure time and downtime and how to reframe that so that they don't have to distract themselves in their life or find opportunities to engage in unhealthy behaviors that they can redirect that and put that towards hobbies and skill building 
and family activities and finding potentially a career or education that might suit them. Another opportunity for respite is the idea of crisis intervention and crisis management. Again, being able to allow them the time after they've been triggered or that there's a crisis allows them time to recuperate from that. Studies show that individuals in combat-related scenarios, those individuals that have been injured and put into some kind of deep sleep um, medically have actually come out with less PTSD symptoms than the individuals in their group that experienced and watched and witnessed that individual get harmed. The reason being is because that individual had rest. The rest that the body needs to recover and recuperate quite often looks the same after a real-time combat situation as a triggering and a treatment environment. Perceived truth and perceived reality is very real, and individuals that are triggered in a group can be just as effective as if they were still in the field. And allowing the time and respite to rest and rejuvenate and heal can be all the difference between sustained recovery and a relapse. The idea of safety and creating a safe environment allows an individual with PTSD symptoms or even anxiety symptoms such as hypervigilance and hyperjustice to have an environment that they can feel like they can let their guard down and become vulnerable. Again, in understanding our roots, if we're able to create a culture of safety, a, cult a culture that allows for grown men who have seen some of the worst atrocities in the world to be vulnerable and talk about them and process them, is dynamic treatment. And the opportunity to do so gives them a sense of physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental safety. And this is exactly what they need to heal and recuperate. And finally, with respite, I would suggest that the opportunity for resiliency and strength-based interventions requires time to process. At St. Joseph Veterans Program, we offer trauma group, but I would suggest even more importantly, we offer a resiliency group. That resiliency group doesn't necessarily walk them through the negative experiences. What that group offers is hope. It offers the op opportunity for the group to identify their strengths, to identify experiences of resiliency, and draw on them, share them, and experience them. Sometimes the future focus is a much more practical way to effect change than walking through what can be a very painful past. The next aspect of the truce is the element you, which is unconditional positive regard. This is drawn from Carl Rogers. I would suggest also Albert Ellis's unconditional self-acceptance and unconditional other acceptance fits well with this. The opportunity here is really understanding that what we're trying to do in treatment quite often with a service member is to establish a sense of value, worth, and purpose. What's interesting is these people have done a phenomenal job of serving their country in some of the most stressful situations. They have learned military values such as leadership, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And while sometimes addiction has taken over before, during, and after those values are instilled, they're still there. And those have been largely what was the success of the veteran themselves. And so helping them identify that those are instilled in their value system, that their moral compass is intact, it allows them to find unconditional self-regard or unconditional self-acceptance. Once they're able to find that, they begin, they begin to feel value and they begin to seek for purpose and direction. And being a part of that is probably one of the most rewarding experiences I could suggest you have. Helping them understand and empower them that as an individual, they have a vast and important effect on the group that, and the milieu that they live in and the families that they interact with. It's important for them to understand that being a husband, a father, a son, a nephew, is one of the most, if not the most important role that they could have as an adult. Helping them understand that the military values that they were instilled with can be drawn out and utilized in those different relationships allows them to not only find purpose, but understand that they have a unique set of skills that make them incredible fathers and husbands and sons. 
The identifying of individual strengths, needs, abilities, and preferences allows them to empower themselves to understand that they do understand themselves. They're able to recognize what they need to be successful and allows for very person-centered treatment. The other opportunity with unconditional self-regard or unconditional positive regard is that they begin to understand that there's motivation with value. And that begins to give them a sense of purpose. Quite often at St. Joseph Veterans Program, a resident will find purpose in the sense of higher education. What's interesting is, is unconditional positive regard allows them to have the sense that they are valuable enough and worth educating and that they may have a specific worldview that the world wants to hear and needs to hear. That motivation allows them not only to strive for furthering their education, but often starts to permeate into other areas of their life. They begin to take care of their, their health and well-being. They begin reading more and exciting the brain with different activities. They begin to become more social and understand their sense of role in a community. And this is exactly what a service member needs. They need to understand how important it is for their contribution to society. And we need to share that we value that. Finally, with unconditional positive regard, one of the most important pieces to this element is the identification of their values. Quite often, survivor's guilt and moral injury will set these aside and help them feel as helpless and as evil as possible. What's important for us to understand is that they've seen and done things that may have not been necessarily aligning with their moral compass and helping them recognize that the disturbance that they're feeling is quite often proof that their moral compass is very much intact. And so being able to draw on that and help them understand and identify what their values are allows them to begin to recognize that they're good, decent people. A good, decent person typically takes care of themselves, which is a strong indicator that there's unconditional positive regard. I would suggest, as staff members in this field, we also need to practice unconditional positive regard, not only for those that we work with and work for, but ourselves. And if there's anything I could say today, it would be to make sure you're taking care of yourself and those that you provide treatment with and for. Now we come to the second to last part of the acronym of TRUCE, which is connection. I would suggest that this is probably the most important element that we can talk about this morning in talking about veterans, the veteran population, and their families. It's quite often been said that the disease of addiction is the disease of connectivity. As the disease progresses, people begin to isolate, they begin to turn away from resources and networks that were once most supportive and begin to find themselves helpless, hopeless, and alone. The opportunity for connection over a long-term treatment stay for veterans is particularly important because this is how they've survived. In basic training, you're trained not to keep yourself alive, but to keep the people next to you alive, and they will keep you alive. This ingrained into your head and your heart helps you understand the importance of teamwork, of the importance of the collective whole, and how to fulfill and complete missions, not only for the success of the, of the mission, but for the success of the relationship of the man next to you. It's important to understand that the congruence of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors can go both ways. So a treatment environment that has people with common ideals, values, and experiences can draw together and become one of the most powerful and empowering groups that you'll ever experience. And understanding, again, who you are and why you do what you do, and understanding the culture and your roots and heritage of the vision can help identify residents who are able to understand, agree, and support those visions and live out that mission. They can become your biggest advocates and you can become their biggest coaches. The opportunity not only for therapeutic relationships, which are so important in individualized person-centered treatment, but also for the specific population to be able to connect and identify with and relate to is probably one of the most important elements 
of treatment at St. Joseph's Veterans Program. The opportunity for a veteran or a service member to come in and share their experiences with others who will not judge, but will actually say, I've been there too, or I understand how you feel because they've been there, is one of the unique experiences that makes common connections important. Another important element, particularly for families, is the opportunity for long-term reconciliation and family services to reconnect families and their loved ones. The opportunity not only for phone conversations, but for visits, and for the opportunity for a unique three-day family session that the Veterans Program offers, is the opportunity to reconnect, to reconcile, and to identify what important connections are going to be your lifelines as you progress through your recovery. Again, the cultural sensitivity and understanding of how important it is for veterans and service members to enjoy downtime together, to enjoy activities together, to share a common language and experience together, quite often will help them mend the wounds that were so painful during their military experience. Connection also looks like resources and support networks. Helping an individual make connections in the community and the world around them as they go through treatment. Helping them identify what connections are at their home of record or where they're going for aftercare or following their treatment episode can be some of the most important work that you do. At St. Joseph's Veterans Program, every hero that goes through treatment will create a binder. The binder is a resource binder identifying everything from transportation to outpatient services to places to play sports, hobbies, and social networking in the area that they plan to move on after their treatment episode. This opportunity allows them to begin to make connections before they even leave the building. This allows to bridge the gap between the different levels of care and quite often can be some of the safest, healthiest transitions that we've seen. Particular with the veteran population is that they're a very intelligent group of people. Not like other groups are not intelligent, but understand that they have been asked to have some of the most important decision-making skills under some of the most pressure that they'll probably ever see. Which means when they engage in a higher education, quite often it's a very successful experience. Again, having the opportunity in a long-term treatment facility, having the time to take them and reintegrate them back into a campus can be extremely important and beneficial. Oftentimes, if PTSD symptoms are present, they don't want to be in a room full of other students or people in general. So what we do is we can slowly take them for a drive around the campus. And then maybe one day it'll be a walk around the campus. And then we can have them introduced to the professors and the different people that work at the college. And then we begin to introduce them into a more social setting and allow them on their pace at their time to be successful gaining a higher education. It's not for a lack of intelligence. It's for the experiences they've been through and the opportunity to reintegrate in a healthy, appropriate manner. And the last element of our framework, again, truce, is experience. Like I said earlier, if I had to theme our program, I would say it's experiencing recovery. Something unique to veteran, veterans um, is that they quite often have been tasked with a responsibility and accountability beyond their age. The fact that they're able to engage in exercises that are military specific and be successful between the ages of 18 and 23, quite often is when a service member joins the military, is a very responsible task that not everybody is able to complete. So the opportunity to respect that, identify and value that, and acknowledge that by allowing the individuals to one, create a safe and healthy environment for themselves and the world around them, but two, allow, in the, allow them to engage in the risky behavior of actually entering the community and working through an experience and coming back and processing it is one, one of the very important opportunities to use their skills during their treatment episode. At St. Joseph's Veterans Program, during their admission time frame and early in their treatment, they're allowed very little to no off-site privileges unless they're with staff members. The reason being is because it's a trust building pro process. 
the opportunity to understand who the individual is, be able to recognize their skills, and whether or not they're able to create a safe and healthy environment, not just in the treatment facility, but outside of it, and to allow the opportunity to support them if they're triggered by the community or specific areas of the community. As they progress through treatment, largely on an individual base, working with their primary counselors and the multidisciplinary treatment team at the Veterans Program, they're given opportunities in battle buddy teams to walk into town and back or to go to the library or go have lunch together. Now this sounds risky and I would agree. This is risky behavior. It leaves the opportunity for them to make poor life decisions and unfortunately to not re-engage in treatment. But keep in mind that these are voluntary treatment programs. The door is never locked. And so giving them the opportunity to plan, execute, and return from what I would call a mission, which might simply be getting a library card, gives them the experience to draw on that they are trustworthy, that they have purpose, and that they're able to be responsible. Now this is very unique, and this is also very individual, based on individual assessment of the person and their ability and skill level, and I would not suggest this to be something that's done across the board. You have to understand your people, your treatment team, and your population in order to be successful as often as possible. But understand that at the intensive residential level of care and the community and supportive living levels of care, they need that support, but they need the opportunity to gain experiences, positive experiences to replace the negative that quite often came with their active addiction. So exposure to different experiences, whether that might be relational, whether that's community, whether it's exposure therapy and allowing them to process and walk through their trauma and work through their story and begin to minimize or understand that they're capable of enjoying a quality of life. Their education, having them experience the fact that they're able to learn and turn on new emotions and gain emotional vocabulary and have educational opportunities such as lecture series, local colleges, different community opportunities. The fact that they're able to learn and grow shows that there's a signs of health and well-being and that quite often can be contagious and motivating. Helping them understand the difference between current evidence and past history. Again, I will tell you that the most important thing as far as experience goes is giving them the opportunity to gain as much positive experiences as they can during the time they're in your treatment uh, services the opportunity for them to understand that while they may have had negative past experiences, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person or that they're incapable of positive experiences can be very liberating. So allowing them the opportunity to interrelate and to have those experiences helps them understand just how successful they're going to be in their sustained recovery. Again, I would suggest this is of utmost importance with veterans and their family members. Having them understand that while in the past they may have struggled with their roles, they may have struggled with their identity or their relationships, does not necessarily mean that reconciliation cannot happen and that the family isn't going to welcome them back. It's one of the most empowering and beautiful opportunities to see a veteran find their family, find their role, and engage in a purposeful relationship. And that's what they need. Understanding again the commitment to social learning and growth and change and helping the residents instill those as a positive and helping them recognize that yes, while they may have trained and learned a, a lot of skills throughout their time in service or preparing for their time in service, that they haven't lost the opportunity to continue to grow and change and use those skills and resources in different ways as a warrior citizen. Giving them and empowering them the opportunity to understand that what they've learned is not only just for a military occupation specialty, but can actually be applied to their quality of life, to their vocation, careers, and to interrelating with other people is probably one of the most important pieces to their experiences. Again, I would stress that experience, and the more you're able to get those experiences and not only bring them to the treatment facility themselves, which they are abounding in your communities, finding volunteers to come in and offer opportunities to share poetry, to read um, historical accounts, drama therapy, music therapy, opportunities to express yourself in different ways, 
There are people out there willing and ready to serve their veterans in a way that can be very productive and personal. Those are the subjective elements that I'd mentioned before as far as what works. Keep them in mind. Help them and help the community understand that veterans are not scary, that they're some of the most important and best representatives of our country, and that they're probably some of the most important members to pass on tradition and heritage of the world around us. And to conclude this block of education, I'd like to share with you a six minute, 30 second video of a resident who successfully completed St. Joseph's Veterans Program and myself talking about the program and veterans in general. I hope you enjoy, thank you. You know, I'm back home, I'm safe, you know, I have issues, but, you know, there are guys that, you know... My deployment was relatively safe. None of my Marines got hurt. Some of them got hurt, but not severely. I had an Iraqi soldier die on me, that's... and a couple more that got injured. But there are guys here that, you know, were in sniper platoons and, you know, had to do shit that, you know, they struggle with every day. Um, Other people have done better, greater things than, than me just surviving. I served in the Army. The majority of the time was in the Army Reserves. I spent some time in the National Guard for 11 years total. And the capacity I work in now is I'm the Veterans Program Director for St. Joseph's Addiction Treatment and Recovery Centers. The men that come in here and stay, they're here for between six to 12 months. Typically the average length of stay that we're finding someone um, able to reintegrate and really get some roots in the ground is around six to nine months time frame. The thing that motivated me to build this garden was I came up here in January of 2015 or 2014, I forget, but it was a brutal winter up here that year. And uh, I was basically locked up in the house pretty much for about three or four months and someone said, you want to build a garden? I said, get me out of this house. So yeah, but, um, but I went to culinary school, so I was also very interested in, in um, kind of that farm to table cooking idea. So that kind of motivated me as well. Brussels sprouts, tomatoes. We built all the beds. I planted everything from seed and uh, just, it was, it was my meditation. I guess it's just in my nature. I just, I enjoy doing things that make people happy. So um, cooking a good meal for someone puts a smile on their face. When I was in Iraq with the Marine Corps, um, I'm a Navy corpsman, so I'm their, I'm their medic, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, we had, we did uh, convoy security for six months, and at that time, it was the height of the IEDs. We ask them to tell their story a lot. As we know and as research suggests, um, as far as working with trauma or PTSD or something of the sort, um, to include addiction in the life that comes with addiction is to tell your story. So sometimes what happens is for someone um, that gets lost in addiction or is engaging in unhealthy behaviors, their story gets very dramatic and it gets very overwhelming. And so the more that we're able to allow these individuals and, and ourselves to tell our story and make connections, understand we're not alone, that's what the day-to-day -day really is. It's trying to provide a safe environment where people can trust each other. It's easier to gain that with another service member than it is with a civilian from the outside. You know, not understanding, especially between combat veterans, not understanding what combat's like, what being in that war zone is like, and the constant pressure of, of, of doing the convoys. I didn't really get a chance to decompress after coming back, so it kinda, I came home went to, to alcohol, to be able to feel comfortable in social situations, to, um, to going to the cocaine because the alcohol was depressing me so much, to going to cocaine to be able to enjoy those social situations again. There's more use than um, what is being reported. I remember when I was serving, any kind of rite of passage, any kind of ritual, any tradition, any time that we had some kind of moment to celebrate, there was alcohol surrounding it. It's so pervasive, you know, you're, you're learned a coping mechanism in your time in service. 
And it would be silly to think you're not going to use a coping mechanism that works. And, and alcohol and drugs work, whether, whether we like it or not, whether it's good for us, they work. You know, this is just my guesstimate that, you know, 80% of the veterans that come out probably suffer with some sort of addiction after being in the combat zone. People that suffer with the addiction and the PTSD, it's, it's, it's not something that, that I was able to do alone. It's not something that most people that I know that went through the, the same problems was able to do alone. So, you know, just like, you know, being in combat, if you're in the sh and you're being pinned down and you need help, you need help, you know, it's, it's you know, whether it's combat or, or life after combat, you know, it's, it's the right thing to get the help that we need when we need it. It took me a few years to actually be able to, to actually truly man up and get the help that I needed. This is a piece of trench art. So this is a World War I artillery round. And what would happen in World War I, this trench art is very prevalent during that time period because the soldiers would trench in and they'd sit around while artillery would just pound away on each other for days on end and the soldiers would be bored so they'd pick them up and they would start making this artwork out of them. This is what a service member feels like. You know, we, when we enlist, we, we get melted down and we get remolded into something that's, that's used for one purpose and that is um, to fulfill the wartime effort. And so, you know, service members are like this artillery round in the sense that um, they'll be used for what they were intended to use for and then quite often feel like they're just discarded. But the reality is, is and, and this is our calling, is, you know, what we can do is we can go up and we can start collecting those rounds, those spent casings, and we can start making some really beautiful art with them. We can come alongside those service members and say, listen, man, that was part of your life. That wasn't your whole life. And actually, there's some really beautiful stuff coming your way if you'll let us put the time and energy into helping you do so. Thanks, Zach. That was terrific. You're welcome. Uh, of course, I, I'm uh, well aware of the kind of uh, the great work that you folks do up at St. Joe's, and now um, hopefully everyone else is too when they watch this. <laughs> Just have a question. We do have uh, several vets programs in the state, but they are more the exception than the norm. So I think a lot of people will be viewing this presentation who, um, who don't work in vet programs, but who may, as a result of their work, find themselves trying to help a vet sure. recover. If there was any one bit of important advice you could give to these people who may, many of them have never actually worked with someone, uh, ex, an ex-military uh, person before. What would that piece of advice be? You know, I think, I think if I had to give one piece of advice, it would be that, and it's going to sound kind of basic, but relationship is everything. When you're working with a veteran or somebody that's served in any capacity, they're going to set the pace. They're going to decide when and what to share. And quite often, they've done a, for, for lack of a better term, a phenomenal job of compartmentalizing their experiences. So as a clinician, I think, you know, what's important to keep in mind is that when they're ready to share, if they're ready to share about any kind of experience they've had through the military, that they will do that on their own time. While it may take a little bit of nudging, to do something like that early in the therapeutic relationship would probably be one of the most dangerous or um, could cause a large step backwards in that therapeutic relationship, if not end it. If a veteran doesn't feel like they're understood, respected, and allowed to pace themselves, quite often they will not only be resistant, but they will just check out. Okay. Thank you. Well, that concludes our presentation for today, and I want to thank Zach Randolph from St. Joseph's Rehab. Zach runs the Veterans Treatment Program at St. Joe's. I'd like to thank him for his time and, and effort he put into this. I wanted to close with a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, if you have any questions regarding this presentation and what you've heard today, please send them to the Learning Thursdays mailbox. 
In addition, I wanted to direct uh, your attention to uh, some information found on the OASIS website regarding veterans programs. I think it's important to note that we, and I'm speaking for OASIS, that we do not certify veterans programs. We only, we certify residential programs or outpatient programs who choose on, really on their own to serve veterans only. I'd like to commend those programs. There are about 16 providers, well they're, they're not about, there are 16 providers in this state who offer veterans only services and they're doing this at 23 different locations. I'm about to add two more to this list. You can find this list at the OASIS website by clicking on the link for treatment on the main page, then selecting the link for specialized services, then veterans. At our, at our veterans pages, of which there are three, you will find a list of these providers. If you have any interest in doing this, setting up a veterans outpatient group, or even a full uh, residential program, I urge you to talk to these people who are already providing these services so you can get their advice and their direction. You can also contact me, Paul Noonan, at OASIS with any questions or any uh, technical assistance you may need regarding this. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for watching and this concludes our presentation. I want to thank Zach and Paul for this presentation as well as their time and their knowledge in the subject area. Thank you for joining us. The presentation in December will be entitled Overview of the uh, SUD Counselor Scopes of Practice and will be presented by Julia Fesco. I will see you in December. And in the interim, Happy Thanksgiving. Bye now.